Okay, well, welcome. Good afternoon. Good morning. It's really exciting to be here with you today. I'm Tom Huntington. I'll be your host today and moderator for Ask the Experts Power Hardware Upgrades by Help Systems. Uh, throughout this webinar, we are recording it. There will be handouts. And let's see what else. We'll have some polling questions along the way. So we'll ask you some questions about yourself and what your background is, and we'd like you to answer those. It always helps Randy, our guest presenter today, in understanding who he's talking to. Speaking of that, Randy, let's turn it over to you. What, what's your background? What do you do for help systems, and how'd you end up here? <laughs> well, the, the good news is the you know mid-range performance group, uh, which my, me and my and my partner and I started uh, boy 30 years ago. Uh, we were acquired by Health System. It's been all, two years, Tom. It's uh, time okay. is flying flying by. Sure so, uh, and uh, and that's been a great relationship, and uh, we're happy to be here. And I am still obviously focused on uh, the ca capacity planning and the performance analysis, you know, services mostly uh, uh, with the, the products that we sell, you know, which is Performance Navigator. Awesome. Thanks, Randy. And then I'm Tom Huntington. I'm our EVP of Technical Solutions at Help Systems. I do a variety of things for Help Systems, but I'm also an IBM Power Champion, so which has been a great um, honor. I've had that uh, um, title for now six years and uh, hoping for next year, seven year. I won't get the seven year itch or anything like that, Randy. So <laughs> excited to be here today. Uh, we have a fairly short agenda because it's a bunch of questions that you all submitted and we're going to answer those. But we do have time for live Q&A at the end. And like I said, we will have a few polling questions too. Randy, if we want, we can turn off our videos too. I don't think they need to see us anymore. And I'm gonna- Yeah, it'll save on bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, we'll save, save on bandwidth. We don't wanna drag the world down. So our first polling question is, uh, we wanna know who we have with us today. So I'm gonna launch that up. Um, yeah, you're gonna have an option to choose Power Systems customer a hardware reseller, a MSP, a managed service provider, an independent software vendor, or IBM, IBMer themselves. I don't know, Randy, do they like us just to call them an IBMer, or is it just an IBM staff? Employee, I'm not sure. Yes, I've never had anybody say, say anything to me that that's a bad thing to say IBMer. Well, good, we have a couple here, so they're willing to admit that. That's great to have you with us. And, um, and we'll share our polling results here in a little bit. Just to remind you, again, August 5th, we have the Upgrading IBM I webinar coming live from Help Systems with one of our expert partners, speaking of MSPs, that'll be joining us to share their expertise on that. And then actually next week, Thursday, we have uh, a, a webinar that will honor the IBM I Systems Administrator. And uh, don't miss that event. That's hosted by my colleague, Chuck Lazinski, and we have some customers and we have some of our own staff joining him and discussing why you all are so important and what you've done for us. And thank you, hats off to all of you for your, your work uh, with COVID-19. Well, let's uh, close this polling um, what results here and take a look at what we have. Um, hopefully that, I wanna share results. Yep. Okay, so we had 58% of you were Power Systems customers or still are Power Systems customers. Uh, almost 25% are MSPs, 12% are IBMers, and then we also have some hardware resellers with us too. So thank you very much for joining us. And that's it for that polling question. You know, let me um, hide that and share out the next set of slides. So, you know, the other thing that Help Systems does is the annual IBMI Marketplace study. We'll be doing that again. Look for that study to be open in the September timeframe and results for, I can't, can't even believe I'm saying this, 2021 will be out there some, sometime in the January timeframe. But from last year, it looked like, um, you know, we had 7% uh, of you that were just upgrading hardware and then um, add in another 28% that were doing both hardware. Uh, so 35% of you this year in 2020 are doing both hardware and software. I wonder how much the epidemic has impacted that. Um, to be interesting to see how that shakes out. But I know we're kind of all systems go. I know I've been working from home now for three, four months, and uh, uh, but uh, quite busy here these days talking to IBM I customers. The other question that we had is, as you plan your IBM I capacity needs for CPU, disk, I/O, you know, what are your concerns? And um, almost 50% of you say you have no concerns. So this probably hasn't been a major issue for you, but others are worried about the accuracy of what their vendor's recommending, 
Um, 14% no or limited internal expertise to do the work, and 10% say no software to accurately predict what they uh, need or should have when it comes to capacity. And while we're here to say, and, and thank you for joining us today, I think we can help you out with that, that whole issue of lack of knowledge. So let's just roll in to our first question here, Randy. And so one of the things that came up multiple times from you that have joined us today is what or how many cores do I really need? Randy, what do you think about that question? Well, that is the uh, ultimate question, and it, it's not necessarily a performance question, although it is a performance question, but it's really a software uh, question and a financial question because, you know, when doing capacity planning, you know, it, it, there's a lot of factors that go into answering that question, right? How many cores do I need? But that is mm -hmm. ultimately the net result of um, any kind of a capacity plan is to give the answer to say, well, what if I use, you know, three cores or four cores or six cores, you know, what's the impact, right? And we're, obviously we're going to do the performance side of that equation, but really what we're trying to do is look at the, the, these other factors, right? So it's software dollars because you'll find, and I'm sure most of you are aware, a lot, if not most of the, the cost of an upgrade happens to be in the software area. Uh, then there's also what are called budget cycles. So it, uh, I was talking to a customer this morning who likes to buy every five years. Well, when you do that, and that's the, if that's the way they want to operate budget-wise, then you have to plan for a lot more growth than you ordinarily would have if you, for example, buy over time. Because a lot of these machines, you know, have extra cores that you're not going to use initially. And you can always add them, you know, as you as you grow. But obviously, that it is a uh, budgeting cycle issue. Uh, and of course, these days, it's always an on-prem and or cloud uh, question. So do I put all of it on the cloud, some of it on the cloud, half and half, you know, three cores, you know, and that obviously will affect the configuration. And the thing to note is the configurations will be different because they operate different financially. So because the cloud, it depends on the vendor, they all work differently, it's gonna affect the financial model. So therefore the configuration will be different with the same workload. So uh, that that comes into question. Um, and as in uh, July the 14th, I believe, IBM announced uh, this Enterprise Pools 2 function that used to be only on the enterprise, but now it's on the scale out system, uh, which will also, basically this is uh, your on-prem uh, pay-as-you-go uh, plan. And obviously that's going to affect how you bring in the initial and uh, configuration and how often you pay and so forth, right? So that that isn't that will affect the capacity plan. Um, install versus activated cores. So getting back to the core question, mm -hmm. well, you may have eight cores, but you may only need to activate four of them, or you know how many. Yeah. And of course, the next question is you know virtualization. Um, so anytime you go from technology A like Power Seven or Power Eight to Power Nine the configuration so it's not only the number of cores but it's how you configure those cores and we're really talking about power vm we're talking about desired and virtuals and maybe mm -hmm. the virtual shared pool which by the way is a way to control the software dollars right so a lot of people don't use that today and it, it's a very effective method uh, uh option within power vm to help you do that and of course io and memory configuration is going to affect that cores. So for example, if today you have an IO or a memory bottleneck and you fix that bottleneck, your CPU is gonna get busier because it's being held back. And if you fix it, all of a sudden your CPU, so that will affect ultimately how many cores you're gonna need, even on your current box or a new box. So there's a lot to consider in answering that question, but that is the key question. So ultimately the answer would be, uh, with this many cores, you know, what what are my options here? So this is just one example, um, and this gets into that question about do I buy up front or do I pay over time? So this happens to be a big enterprise 980. This is a 64 core machine, 
with uh, like a, with 164 LPARs on it. And you can see down at the bottom, it says room for growth. And that's a very key thing. So with 64 cores, uh, I can grow for at 27% a year for three years. So that's ultimately what a lot of uh, CEOs or CIOs are asking, you know, what's my room to grow? Well, you could do it this way. So this says, I, I'm, if I don't plan on growing 27% of the year or for the next three years, and I only want to do this once a year, that's great. Well, what if you want to buy over time, right? So if you, you could run the same machine and get the same performance, by the way, with 45 cores. Now your growth is only 13% a year for three years. So let's say that uh, a, a CIO or the upper management thinks, well, what if we grow more than that? Well, it, it in the middle of the second year, you have 64 cores installed, you're just not using them. So all that matters is yes, you might spend money in that second or third year, to activate or buy some more software licenses, but you have the hardware installed. So it's only a matter of now getting back to that software money. So again, you can start off smaller and then pay as you go, so to speak, uh, with this type of model. You know, the inter interesting thing with that, Randy, is you know, I wonder how many people outside of IBM I and Power really understand that a lot of these boxes are shipped with six cores, eight cores, 12 cores, but customers might only be using two. You know, the customer I talked to this morning said, well, yeah, heck, our business grew by, you know, nearly 100% here during this epidemic, and I just was able to turn on another core. And I don't even think he says my management understand that I could do that. Right. It, it, it's, uh, there are no, well, uh, there's only two models that have one core. <laughs> every, yeah. every other model has, uh, you know, have multiple cores, even though you don't use them. So that's, that's, yeah. uh, uh, that's a great question. So if I'm going into an upgrade and I'm thinking about this for my organization, you know, what should be on my checklist? What are some things I should be thinking about when I look to upgrade? Well, the way I look at it is the first thing one should look at is your the level of software that you're at. Because you need to make sure that the, the Power 9, for example, uh, like in, in IBM I, you have to be at 7.2. Uh, in a perfect world, you need you would want to be at 7.4 TR1, and we'll explain that in a minute here. But in it, you know, and that's pretty up to date, right? So that's kind of the first question is is uh, do you want to have uh, is your software ready to support that target machine? So it's not only IBM I, but it's also your third party software and, uh, and so forth. So that, that make sure you do that, right? Uh, you want to make sure you have performance data on every partition. I can't tell you how many times we do capacity plans and people only send us data on the production machine. And while they have it, that's all that data, matters, isn't it, Randy? Yeah, that's that's all that matters <laughs> performance wise. So they don't really care about performance on the test dev, but they take up resources. So we are going to configure a new machine with resources. So in a perfect world, we'd like to have all that data. By the way, that includes Linux, AIX, BIOS. You know, if you have any of those operating systems run on your power machine, it, it would be nice to have that data so we can actually configure the whole machine instead of just, you know, slicing it up and just looking at one thing. Yeah, more than likely, uh, your developers are going to want to be able to still do development, right? Uh, exactly. And, and and you're going to have to figure out well how much of that machine am I going to give them right? You on Power Seven you give them a core where you may not and probably won't need to give them a core on a Power Nine potentially right? And also it'd be nice to have at least three months of data. Again, getting back to that historical question, the more data the better because you you can just see trends. In a perfect world you'd have a year's because you'd see your whole annual cycle because every business typically has a cycle. Right. right. Over, over Anything else I should have? Uh, well, we need to have the uh, obviously a complete list of the inventory, because um, you you got to go. You, you have to understand where you're coming from, and the partners or IBMers have to, you know, because that could be an upgrade thing or a replacement thing. So you have to understand where you're going from. And I'm gonna say the the last major topic. There's a lot of subtopics. Is <laughs> you really got to consider your your HR and DR strategy. Sure, because that always comes into play. And how, how does upgrading the machine affect either one of those? You know, what's your current strategy? 
are you going to change that strategy uh, based on you know new hardware? So for example, today you're using software replication. Uh, maybe you're going to hardware replication, right? Or vice versa. Uh, so you, you really got to under, while you're doing this upgrade, you really got to might as well take a look, hard look at that HA and DR strategy as well. Okay. So, you know, the age old question, will the Power9 hybrid provide more benefits for my applications that are constrained by CPU or memory? How do you go about determining that, Randy? Well, you know, uh, it, it's sort of funny. Every time we do a capacity plan, I'm going to say most of the time we really have to analyze what the current performance is on their current machine, whether it's a Power 7 or you know, Power 8 or whatever. And the reason is, is because just because you know, when they IBM rates these machines, you know, they use this in the Power 9, or IBM world to CPW in our, in the AIX and BIOS world, you know, it's a, it's a RPERF, right? It's a benchmark number. Sure. But everybody has to remember that's a throughput benchmark number, not a performance benchmark number. So the easiest example is uh, single threaded jobs. So if you're concerned about how long a single threaded job runs, Going from power eight to power nine, it may not, from a CPU standpoint, given the fact that you have the same memory and the same I.O. configuration, it may not run any faster. So the answer is it depends on the application. Now, what happens a lot of times when you go from power you know, seven to eight to nine, even though the CPU piece of this performance of an application may be the same, typically the IO and memory is going to change, which ultimately is going to affect how long that job runs. Sure. So, so but you know, th those are the things you have to really understand your application before that. And, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, scheduling, you know, when things run and how often things run and, and you know, whether it's single threaded or multi-threaded. Okay. So, what are the considerations of upgrading from Power 7 to Power 9? So I'm on Power 7, which is, gosh, that must be already, what, six, seven, eight years old already, I guess? Right, right. Yep. Uh, and, and, of course, it, it, the world has changed a lot. <clears throat> so right. a lot of considerations you know, when you're upgrading, other than we mentioned the software, make sure you're at the level that can support Power 9, all your software, the IBM I and the you know, application and so forth. But it, again, it because of technology has advanced so much that the way you approached things in Power 7, you know, six, seven years ago, uh, is there's better ways to do it now. Um, and that includes HA and DR, and, and, and but a lot of it has to do with IO. And again, a lot of it has to do with I know uh, uh, a lot of people in that power seven to power nine, everybody is going to look at, should I go to the cloud or should I, uh, you know, go on prem? And by the way, they, they, when you, when you go to a cloud, the thing to think about today, if you're on prem, you, you may have multiple LPARs on a machine, but when you go to the cloud, oftentimes, it, you know, it's what's called multi-tenant. In other words, you're going to be playing in the same sandbox with a bunch of your schoolmates. And so it's, it, it's, it's important to understand what that sandbox is and right. how big it is and who else is in that sandbox, right? Yeah. Uh, because they can all affect each other. So, uh, so, so your, your management probably will, and it's, it makes sense to look at going to the cloud because of the financial reasons and potentially performance reasons, right? It may be less expensive for you. Again, it's that cost performance equation, right? I want the best performance for the you know lowest amount of cost. And, and maybe the answer is cloud versus on-prem. Sure. Okay. Well, we've been talking about Power 7 and Power 9. How would you compare Power 9 to Power 7? What are some of the differences? Uh, well, obviously, from a CPW standpoint, again, there's there's um, uh, there's more throughput per core, machine, right? yeah, per core, right? Obviously. Um, what are we at? Like nineteen thousand per core on Power Nine, and probably in the neighborhood of ten thousand, eight thousand on Power Seven. Right, right, and and then of course there's the SMT, symmetrical multi-threading. You know, you might be you know running four 
SMT and seven, and now you're going to be running eight. So, so some applications like maybe you're running WebSphere or HTTP server on IBM I, those things are going to take advantage of the SMT, right? Exactly. So again, the architecture itself has changed. And particularly with these new G models, and for those that on the call that may not know, like I said, January, July 14th, they've announced the new scale out in their G models. Um, right. You know, the back plane is all uh, PCI 4. So they got more bandwidth in the back plane. But again, uh, which gives you more opportunity to use some of these NVMe uh, IO devices. So your the choices What's, of IO. What is, Randy, what is NVMe? Non volatile memory express is what NVMe stands for. It's basically and you it's know, disk. And it's disk, disk, right? Right. It's it's um, it's flash memory. It's just packaged differently, and it talks over a different protocol. So NVMe is actually an industry standard protocol that's actually faster than you know SCSI or SAS, you know, which is a which protocol is about how. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Which is a protocol about how controllers talk to disk drive and so forth. So the NVMe protocol, because of flash, is a uh, with flash is obviously a much more efficient, therefore faster protocol and so that's a i'm gonna call it a generic name now you'll know that the nvme technology comes in all you know i don't know five six package formats you know whether it's internal or external uh but they all basically you got to think about it they're going to talk in the language of nvme uh and it could be packaged differently but power nine increased the the number of options you have uh particularly uh, because of they've expanded the PCI uh, for Gen 4 slots that gives us more capability, particularly with internal disk. Okay. So a lot of reasons that Power9 is 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 faster, and then of course cost has gone down, so you should get a higher return on investment, right? Correct. And just like any, uh, and this has been, you know, the idea is that once you run out of maintenance, you have to start paying, you know, hardware maintenance and so forth. Well. You know these machines come with three-year warranty and you know that's part of the cost savings right you up sure you purchase the machine but you get three years of warranty so you save in the warranty and again getting back to the core thing let's say on a power seven you are running on eight cores sure well maybe on a power nine you may only need four and that's gonna ripple through all of the software money so or most of the software money right so again the hardware configuration is certainly going to affect that software component which is often more than 50 percent you know of the total cost okay well we had an interesting uh, performance question somebody is wondering what's the difference between what the hmc is representing from performance and the lpar itself for performance reporting and boy, Tom, I love this question because we get this question. I, I'm glad somebody asked it because yep. uh, I get this question asked, you know, two or three times a month. So, you know, the HMC, uh, you know, obviously is where you configure a machine. And it's basically saying, I'm going to give you, I want to guarantee you get, you know, in this case, 7.5 cores. I'm going to guarantee you do that. But I'm going to let you have, you know, eight or nine cores if you need it, right? So that's, and you're in an uncapped uh, uh, mode, right? So, and the HMC does track this thing. And, and so here's a good picture of what the HMC's view of the world is, right? So the, as far as the HMC is concerned, he's saying that as far as this partition, and where, if you look at the date up there, it's the, we're looking at the same date, it's the July the 13th. You know, he's saying on average you used, uh, set, you know, you're set for seven and a half, you use 7.82, and at one point you use 7.95 cores. So that's what it thinks, right? So the, the, the from my experience, the, the word of caution would be, um, and this is its view of the world, which is not, it's correct, it's its view of the world, but it's a different view. So here is the view of the system itself. So this is basically collections. This is an nice theme. So it's collection services data. So you can see on the same day, the most 
this machine ever used was six cores. So one would say, well, what's the difference, right? <laughs> what's, wh why did it think seven and a half cores or whatever, and this is versus six? Well, there's a couple of things. One is the granularity at, at which you collect data. And so you can see down at the bottom there, if you, uh, th these are 15 minute intervals. So you're averaging over 15 minutes, right? Now you can lower that to five or whatever, that's pretty easy to do, but it, that's one thing. So the HMC, it maybe it's a, it's a smaller interval when it's measuring things, right? And it's, you can't even see the interval, but it's real small, right? So that's another point, right? Um, and the second point is the HMC uh, basically dispatches a processor to a LPAR and says, okay, you can have it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to use it. In fact, most IBMI shops, if you look at the data, there's a lot of what's called dispatch weight. In other words, the operating system has dispatched the, the LPAR to a processor, but it's not using it because it can't because somebody else is using it. Got so, it. yeah, so it's just a, it's a different view of the world. So my word of caution here is in this case, if you looked at the HMC, it says you need to go and add another core. I mean, it's sort of what's telling you, right? Because mm -hmm. you're bumping up to it, right? I mean, you're right. going over what you've been allocated. Correct. If you added another core to this petition, it's not going to use it anyway. It's not using what it's got now. Yeah. So it's not going to help you. And it's it's not that it's wrong. It's just that it's from its point of view. So it uh, in my experience, the best way, to, and this goes with IBMI or AIX or BIOS or Linux, is to look at the performance from the operating system's point of view because it's it knows it's closer to home base, so to speak, than, than the HMC is like one step removed. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, you know, the, the, you know, again, it's important for every operating system to be looking at what's actually happening within that operating system, right? Which is almost even more and more important, again, when we get back to this cloud versus on-prem discussion, right? What are the pros and cons of that? And I'll point out that Randy and I did a webinar with Ash Giddings from our team back um, in, in May timeframe, I believe, or, or late April, and we talked completely on the topic of IBM I cloud migration considerations, and a big portion of that was performance and what you should be thinking about when you're looking at going to the cloud. So Randy, any other comments or thoughts on that? Well, I think the biggest thing customers should look at when looking at a cloud vendor is you, have to really understand, you know, how they charge because the, the, the idea is great. In other words, you want to pay for what you use, right? Uh, well, the question is, is when I need more than I've purchased, what happens? And right. by the way, the power VM is the same. It doesn't matter if it's on-prem or in the cloud, it's going to operate the same. So. It depends on how the power VM virtualization is configured. That's going to determine what happens when you need more than you, you know, the flexibility there, right? Right. And, and also, it's also when things happen. So it makes things more complicated. So for example, right. if you have a bunch of LPARs, uh, because you know, uh, most cloud vendors are going to charge you for some base amount uh, and, and how that's determined is going to be different. And then if you use more than your base amount, they're going to charge you, you know, by the minute, by the hour, by the CPW, by the day, you know, there's all kinds of methods of charging you. But, you know, a great example is, is if you only need, let's say on average, most of the month you need one core, but one day a month at month end, you need a, a one and a half cores. So in the cloud, it probably doesn't make sense for you to, buy one and a half cores and pay for it all month long. It, it would be less expensive for you to go ahead and pay for that one day when you when you need it mm -hmm. versus not. So that's the beauty of the cloud, right? It gives you that flexibility to do that. But right. you gotta understand, ask the questions about, you know, uh, really understand how they how they charge and what happens when you go over this base. And, and uh, the second thing is really ask what kind of machine you're gonna be running on. 
Right. You need to understand the hardware that they're actually going to be running your application on. Yep, because they could say, hey, they'll have the same number of processors, but their shared workload and things like that. You know, one other point I'd like to make on this, Randy, is and I think everybody out there knows what a job log is, right? So a job log on IBM I is basically a historical log of what happened within a job. And if you have a problem with that job and you don't have a job log, how do you know what happened, right? So if you take that and equate that to going to the cloud, if you go to the cloud and you have a problem and you don't have the performance data that you used or what was consumed when you were on premise, how do you know what changed and what's different? So we really encourage people who are going to the cloud to make sure that they keep that historical data around because if there are problems and there were promises made and things don't perform well, um, it's what do you have to go back on? No, you, you make a great point there, Tom. Uh, so I would summarize that by saying, regardless of whether you're on-prem or on the cloud, you should continuously collect data. So it's either the customer's doing it or the cloud vendor's gonna do it for you. Mm -hmm. And so you need to have access to that data one way or another, right? And so that's another, uh, make a good point. That's another question just ask the, the vendor of a cloud, say, or, you know, what performance data are you going to provide me on a regular basis so I can understand what's going on if and when I have a problem in it? It's not if, it's when, right? Because it, yeah. it will happen. So the, the next question we have again, cloud versus hybrid or, you know, a combination of, we still have a few apps running in our data center. Would you recommend going completely cloud or hybrid? Well, that, uh, in fact, I just got asked that question yesterday. Uh, in other words, a vendor wanted to take, a customer wanted to take one of his apps off of his production machine and put it to a cloud. So again, this gets back into understanding your application at a really, I want to call it a deeper level. And the only way to do that is to collect data continuously because you need to profile the resources consumed by every job and every user in terms of CPU and memory and disk and that. So that's really the only way you can get a real good answer uh, to that. So once you understand the resources that an application is consuming, then you can say, well, it's gonna cost me A to run it in the cloud or B is gonna cost me you know, this much money to run it in a uh, um, on-prem solution or sure. then it's a higher Thing, right so uh so it you have, in order to understand the financial equation which it ultimately always comes down to right you need to understand that workload and again it gets back to continuous uh uh collection of data because the data is going to be the same regardless of whether you're going on-prem or cloud or hybrid it doesn't matter it's just how you're going to interpret it but you have to have the data so if you don't have the data it's just kind of almost impossible to answer that question it is. I mean, it's amazing the number of discussions we get into. Well, let's move on to our, our we do have another polling question for you. I'm going to launch that in the background. Um, we want to know when do you plan to upgrade uh, your power server uh, in the next three months? By end of 2020, in 2021, we're already on Power 9. We don't know if Power 9 is right for us and we might be just holding and waiting till we go to Power 10. While you're answering that, I will tell you that for customers going to the uh, S914 or S924s, uh, um, we do have the Solution Edition program that Help System is part of. It's something you should check out if you're going to be upgrading your hardware. We do have some nice discounts on software, nice options on some free training and other things that we bundle in to our Help System Solution Edition program. You can find information about that on our website. So I hope and I encourage you to take a look at that. Looks like only 25% of you have voted out there. What's going on? Either they all fell asleep on us, Randy, or they're just bashful and don't know how to answer this question, or I didn't give them the right options. Okay, that's a little better there. Thank you yeah. <laughs> for those who have jumped in here. You make the webinar better if you participate. That's really part of it. Okay. All right, that's long enough on that. Otherwise, we'll waste all of our time there. So I'll share that out to you right now. We'll see that about 6% in the next three months. Uh, by the end of 2020, so over the next six months, 24%, 24% in 2021, 18% uh, were already on Power 9, and 29% don't know if Power 9 is right for us. So I thank you all for answering that question and participating 
in our polling question. Let's move on to ask the experts and yes, storage. Which technology should I consider, Randy? HSC, oh boy. <laughs> B, SSD, NME, you know, SCM, hybrid, what, what do you think? How do we answer this, this question? This is the, uh, uh, the, the thing I spend most of my time on. And, I, and I'll, I'll say once we've talked about how many cores, right? Well, ultimately, once you understand your application and the stuff we talked about, the answer is, you know, two or three cores. You know, you're going to go back to management and says, well, if I have two cores, you know, it's this much money, right? And this right. performance. If I have three cores, it's this much money and this much cores, right? So it's, I want to say once you get there, it's really to management, it's option A, option B, maybe option C about how many cores you want, right? Right. With disk, it really depends on A, where you're coming from. And then where am I going to go to, right? And then, of course, the question is, how do I get there, right? And it's a uh, migration. But today, obviously, there's spinning disk, which is HSDs. There's SSDs still, um, you know, which is flash memory packaged to look like a disk drive that talks SCSI. Mm. NVMe is flash memory, but it talks NVMe. But it's in a different format. So you can have NVMe and that is packaged like a disk. But you have to have it in a controller or a uh, rack that is going to talk in VME protocol, you know, like a controller or a rack, right? Sure. Uh, it comes in a card, and these are new, by the way, right? And this is important to, in fact, uh, 74 TR1 is, is, need needed. To have, is needed to take advantage of the new cards. And there's a new uh, format called U2. Um, don't ask me where they come up with these names, but um, <laughs> there's they, a lot of rock and roll fans uh, down in Austin, uh, Texas. I think. Exactly, yeah. Um, so they uh, uh, those they're not uh, the cards are really goes on the motherboard, right? And the U2s are connected to the motherboard, but they're actually I'm gonna sort of like a credit card size unit that goes in the front of the machine. Mm. And there's X number of them, right? And so that's format. Storage class memory today is only important to uh, external storage. But if you're going to external storage, that is that is a step above flash memory. Mm -hmm. So that's even faster than flash memory. But there's only a few of them. We're just they just get started. So. In IBM's uh, storage, you can have a few of these, uh, like in the flash memory uh, system. So, but that is a, so that's sort of like you get into that. Now you have uh, uh, Easy Tier. If that for those who are familiar with Easy Tier, which basically moves, it's it's a hierarchical storage management software that moves data from slower devices to faster devices. So, if you have an external device with storage class memory in it, it would move it from NVMe drives to storage class memory because it's in theory faster, right? So that's just another class that's that's new and upcoming. And then of course you have a hybrid. And a lot of times the hybrid is a result of money, to be honest. So if you look to said, I want the you know, I want the I want a Mercedes Benz. Well, I just drive this thing back and forth to work. Maybe I don't need a Mercedes Benz. So maybe I need to go buy a, an Acura or you know, something or maybe it's a hybrid, right? Sure. So that, it's a mixture basically of any and all of these above, which could be the most economical uh, uh, option. Or like your production, you may want the fastest thing and maybe your t d desk dev, you can do, do just fine with spinning disk. Right. So it gets it gets into your applications and, you know. And again, so the important, I think the important thing here, Randy, too, is not to talk over you, but is that with your what if capabilities in Performance Navigator, you can do some different what ifs for customers, right? Exactly. So the answer is, is what what is my response? What's my current response time? Mm -hmm. What if I you know, did spinning disk, what if I did SSDs, and what if I did NVMe, and what if I did, you know, hybrids and so forth. So ultimately our job, you know, as an analyst to say, given this option, this is your performance. Now the business partner or the IBMer are gonna tell you how much that costs, right? Yep. So our job is to say, here's the config that would give you this performance. And then the IBM or business partners are going to say, well, that's going to cost you X amount of dollars. And so now you have the cost performance equation that we talked about. Got it. Got it. 
So what do we need to know about upgrading to flash storage? And I think we have some examples with this. Exactly. So the the uh, biggest question about flash disk is, is understanding your I.O. workload. And really what we're talking about is understanding your read and write, not only your read and write ratio, like what is your read to write ratio, uh, because a lot of people, particularly with IBM I, right, they're going from internal and maybe going to this, this flash memory or going to an external disk, right? So this happens to be an example of a customer who was all solid state disk internally. Uh, and by the way, you, you cannot get faster than all solid state disk internally, except for NVMe. So you now have the NVMe option, which is faster than internal solid state disk. But if you go to external NVMe, it will not be faster. It may be okay. It may be satisfactory. It may work for you because you want to go to external for other reasons like encryption and full flash copy and virtualization. Uh, virtualization. And there's a lot of reasons to go to external storage other than performance. But here's an LPM. example. Right, yeah, LPM, exactly. So uh, here's an example. This is the after picture. So th this happens to be a all NVMe external device for this customer. So and this was internal. This, this is, is internal. internal. Yep. Right. And this you, is external. Yep. Same customer. Yep. Same time. Same customer. Yep. And so you can see the that time? the right response oh. time, well, there was two different days, but it was the yep. right response time internally was if you go back to the other picture there tom yep. yeah you can see that right response time was in the neighborhood of let's call it let's call it 100 milliseconds okay uh, excuse me 100 microseconds this is microseconds microseconds 100. when they went to external nvme through vials all of a sudden now it's 400. so in this case uh we we and this is a great example so because they wanted to go to external for a lot of the other advantages that external brings to the, to the party right but performance is not one of them so when they first went they had a performance problem right so the the answer to this question is uh basically uh reduce the number of ios you're doing you know and people say well how do you do that well in this particular case it was journaling Mm. They did not have the high availability journal performance option for the operating system. Mm. And a lot option of 42. the, yeah, option 42, a lot of the IO was caused by journaling. So when they turned that on, they reduced their IO workload. And, you know, basically this, this longer write turned the, runtime of a job it went it went hours longer so we didn't fix the write because that's as fast as it's going to go but what we did is we fixed the delay of the journaling which actually now made it they now it runs shorter than it did before hmm. because we're all going to so there's there's different ways to approach it but this is one of the things to consider is not only your write um you know your write throughput or hours per second but your read and write disk response time so depending on where you're coming from and the reason why internal disk is is so fast with writes, it's typically always 100% cache hit. Yeah. So cache hits is the big deal, right? Uh, and it's really fast. And and that's sort of the one thing to consider. And I, I call it setting expectations. This may be okay, but you just want to ex set expectations that when you go to this technology, this is sort of what's going to happen performance-wise, right? So we've talked a little bit about NVMe already, but uh, customer Smith said, hey, I heard that compared to HHD and SSD, NVMe drives can save costs while significantly improving performance. Uh, we talked a little bit about what the performance benefits are. What have you seen, Randy, in your looking at systems? And this is basically a very true statement. <laughs> um, okay. So Yeah, so what we've seen is, remember that last graph, which happened to be a customer with all solid state disk, and let's say the writes were about 100, microseconds right right uh with nvme on the motherboard right it was 40 
microseconds. So you're saying we went back here, we're at 100, it went down even further. Yep. Went down to 40. Yes. Wow. I mean, it is, I mean, I'm going to say screaming fast now. And <laughs> it's really inexpensive. And the, the, uh, we had the to change our reports to handle it in some cases, right? <laughs> uh, we did. We had to change because we always had my, uh, milliseconds as a, uh, a label here. And we have to start making that stuff in microseconds so you can read the graph, right? Yeah. So we're getting so fast. But the thing to think about here is the, you know, these are devices that are owned by a partition, whether that partition is a BIOS partition or a production, mm -hmm. partition, right? Now so you when, can when did virtualize NVMe it. The market, Randy. I'm sorry. When did NVMe hit the market again? So externally, NVMe hit the market oh probably a year ago or more. Mm -hmm. uh, you can buy NVMe drives externally, uh, but these new cards, uh, they were actually, they came out, uh, I'm going to say second quarter. April 14th, maybe? Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> April 14th. There you go. <laughs> and they came Fair out question. and, yep, and, and, but you could only stick so many of them, right? They had limitations because of the the number of PCIe 4 and, and 3 slots, right? But when they announced the G models, obviously that expanded number of cards you can put in this. So for example, in the 914, you can actually, between the cards and the U2 devices, you can have 11 of these things. And that's a lot of terabytes, by the way. These come in, you know, uh, 1.6, 3.2, and 6.4 terabytes. Now, sure. the thing to think about is, is you have to mirror these devices because there is no RAID. So you have to buy twice as much as you need because you have to mirror them, right? Second consideration, at least currently, there's no encryption. Hmm. So if you need encryption, that's re you're really looking at an external option, right? Um, and then the other question is, if you go this route, it's a virtualization question. So should I attach these to a BIOS and virtualize mm -hmm. it that way? And that, by the way, that is through vSCSI. It's not MPIV because this is obviously internal. So you're going to virtualize this through vSCSI. Or you could attach it to a production system and virtualize it to a dev partition through vSCSI as well. Sure. Right? And so that's yeah. the thing to think about. Uh, and again, uh, and, and so let's say the new G models, because you have so many more slots, you can attach these, let's say production, you need two of these things and your dev, you need two of them. In fact, I sure. just did one that's that exact thing. There was a production and dev. Dev is, the production is gonna have two of the 6.4s and, uh, I mean, production is two of the 6.4s and dev is gonna have two of the 3.2s. Okay. And so, you know, because you're going to allocate those cards, uh, you know, to a given partition, and with so they seven, can't be four, shared; they have to be allocated. Correct. You have to directly allocate it to a partition uh, in pairs. Uh, and now you can do three, by the way, which is you can mirror odd number of cards. That's the other thing that's I'm, I don't know if it's new or not, but certainly, so you can have three cards and still mirror them. It's sometimes hard to get your head wrapped around that, but you can. Okay. <laughs> and you can have five of these things. So, um, but that's main, the mess, the main thing to think about. Uh, but from a performance things, these things will scream. So if you don't need encryption, and um, and you don't yeah. need, uh, the, it is a very viable option, particularly you know with these G models because you have you have you can get more of them. Yeah. You know, and I, I the whole disk encryption thing kind of. What does that really get you other than helping you maybe pass an audit? I mean, does it really deliver value for customers when you think about it? When's the last time somebody's stolen a disk? Correct. And this is, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know. Significant cost, it, right? Yeah. We're talking about, yeah, encrypting on, on, at rest, you know, on the disk yeah. it's encrypted. Yeah. 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 It's a good question. What's I the mean, value of that? I mean, because really it's your data in flight today and it's the data that's coming out to your display station because just because it's encrypted in disk doesn't mean you've protected a credit card number being shown from a query or any of those things. So I kind of question that one when customers spend a lot of money on disk encryption. Yeah. Personal opinion. 
Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a, you got to understand what you're getting when you do that. <laughs> yeah. So other than um, other than passing an audit, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you can pass an audit with it. Hey, we got disk and disk at risk encrypted. Okay. Yeah. Check mark. So, what's the impact of software and hardware replication on these power boxes? And I think we have some charts to talk about that too. Oh yeah. So um, one of the things to think about, you know, as we mentioned up front, is when you're upgrading, obviously you need to think about your HA and DR strategy, right? And so mm -hmm. we're, we're basically talking about, am I going to do software encryption or uh, HA or DR, or I'm going to, am I going to involve um, the hardware uh, at some point, right? A replication, mm -hmm. right? And so am I going to change from one to the other or, you know, vice versa? But one of the other questions that you need to ask uh, is if you're particularly this, you have to ask this question if you're going to the cloud, right? Let's say forget HA department. If you're going to upgrade, you're going to the cloud. You have to know what your bandwidth is. In other words, how much megabytes per second do I am I writing? And therefore, that's sort of need to figure out what my bandwidth is from my source to my target. And so here's an example of the way we certainly approach it with the data, right? So this is an average and this is a day. So this is actually total megabytes written. And you can see that the 8th uh, of March that this partition did a little over 50 megabytes, but that's not, that's total, right? But now you need to, we use the daily chart to figure out what the peak is. So we're, then we drill down into the 8th to figure out, okay, that's an average, right? So we're averaging 50 megabytes a second because again, you're thinking about a transmission line, but at some point you got up to 140. Oops, so, did I jump ahead on you? Nope, yeah. no, you're right there. So you okay. drill down into the 8th, and now this is a 24-hour picture of the 8th, and you can see there at 3 o'clock in the morning, you got up to about 140 megabytes a second. So let's say you had a 100 megabyte per second line. Well, you're going to be behind for an hour. Now the question is, does anybody care? Maybe they care, maybe they don't, right? But if you don't want to be behind, for example, you need something more than a, at least 140, right? And here you can see why history, you know, we only know this based on history. And in this case, we only had like four days of data, which is, that's never almost enough. like four. There's never <laughs> enough, right? So if you had three months worth of data, you'd have a much better picture of, or uh, uh, you would raise your confidence level that when I go by this uh, line, that uh, you know, this uh, communication line, that you know I'm going to be okay. So, so Randy, due due to time here, maybe a quick response to this question: When do I need a BIOS server? Uh, BIOS is really great for reducing the cost of hardware because you're going to share that mostly disk, but you can also share your your um, uh, your communication, right? So it's either mm -hmm. your fiber channel or your uh, ethernet, right? So it's really good when you particularly have lots of LPARs, right? Yeah. Uh, or flexibility. Guy with like one or two LPARs doesn't really need vials. To uh, he really doesn't need it unless he really wants to have the flexibility to add a third LPAR someplace and just throw some storage in it, right? Because yep. you got storage is controlled by the vials and as long as you got plenty of storage there, you can just carve it up and yep. give it to somebody. So. That's at a high level and a quick response, you know, when you when you need it, when you don't. Um, it, yep. It's very it's it's great for reducing the cost and sharing resources. You know, it's it's a virtual I.O. service. That's what its name is. Right. Yeah. All right. We do have a few questions out there. Let me move in, though. I'll just kind of remind you uh, who Help Systems is. Our world is always is changing, evolving. Um, we've done acquisitions, but I will say. Randy, you're our last IBMI acquisition, MPG, uh, two years ago. The last six acquisitions we've done have been all off IBMI and, and really a lot of focus in the cybersecurity. But, you know, helping people do pen testing and we do, uh, we have our own SIEM these days, manage file transfer, auditing in the non, but in the IBMI world, of course, encryption. We even do antivirus for I, we do antivirus for AV. We've been doing a lot with automation, a lot of people wanting to do work from home. So if you have anything manual, you got to automate it. So we've been helping people out with doing a lot of automation too. And you know, Performance Navigator lives in our automation space for IBM I. It's also used on Linux, Linux on Power, 
Uh, keep in mind, uh, certainly Randy uses a tool every day, but IBM TechLine uses a tool too, and we can talk a little bit about that relationship. So what I'm going to do, though, while we're getting into some questions, I'll ask our last uh, polling question here and really around the avenue. How can help systems help you? If we can, um, maybe you do need some help with capacity planning analysis. I know many of you said, hey, I'm going to upgrade in six months. Turn on the flight recorder. Get that performance collection data going. Let's get some history, right, before we upgrade. Um, maybe somebody needs problem determination. Randy does a quite a bit of that. He helps people out with, um, I got a sticky widget. I had a performance issue. What's going wrong? What's going on? Um, I do a lot of technology updates with our customers. I did one this morning. It was supposed to be an hour call. It was an hour and a half because the customer just kept going, oh, my gosh, you can help me over here. You can help me over there. Everything from automation to performance to HA. Um, love to do tech updates with our customers, technology updates. And then um, uh, we need to do a software demo. Uh, we certainly can do that, a performance navigator, and get you right into that technology and, and uh, show you how, how powerful Performance Navigator is. So those are, let's see, did I get all the options there? Let's just leave that up while we do some Q&A, Randy. Sure. So again, you know, how does somebody get started with Performance Navigator? How do they get you involved? What happens? Well, that, that's a great question. So the one point that sort of uh, people don't realize is that the data collection piece of Performance Navigator, in other words, the host code, and that's where there's I or AIX or BIOS, it doesn't matter, or Linux, yeah. it's free. Collecting the data is 100% free, and I'm going to say almost no overhead. We do take up a little disk space, very little space. From a CPU standpoint, no one's ever going to notice it. No one's ever noticed it in the 30 years I've been doing this. So there's like... CPU, no overhead, and disk, very little, because we do reduce it. We do manage the space the, uh, that we consume. So that's mm -hmm. usually the big issue, but it's very little. Yep. And that code is free. You know, the the, uh, the cost comes in if you ever want us to analyze it as a service, right? Problem determination, capacity planning. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to purchase the product and do ongoing uh, management reporting or yourself, right? So Yeah, we have a uh, lot of customers that do that, right, on a... On a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, they're reporting Absolutely. to the yep. team. Yeah. But but either way, if you don't have any data, you don't have any analysis. It's that simple. So yeah. and so I would encourage everybody to you know download the, the it's a the interface is a Windows interface for Performance Navigator, but it will prompt you to install whatever host, whether it's AIX or IBM I or Linux. And once you get that, and you can certainly call us and we'll walk you through that. It's, it's straightforward, it's five minutes. And now you have what I like to call the movie camera running. It records data 24 by 7, 365 years uh, a day, amen, forever yeah. and ever. <laughs> and we manage it, right? And so you don't ever have to worry about not having the data. It's the matter of do I want to buy a purchase a license or do yeah. I just want to purchase a service like problem determination or capacity planning? But Randy, the, the follow on question to that from the audience is, but isn't that going to cause a disk space problem for me if I have a year's worth of collection data? Can I do that realistically? Not with raw data, you cannot. That's true. Well, you can, but it would consume a lot of disk. So yeah, you only need to upgrade things, your disk, right? <laughs> Right, yeah, but one of the things that we have done forever, we have a, our, our main job that does the analysis actually is called data reduction. Uh, this this job, although it gets so the performance navigator it, product can run and, and consolidate and redu reduce correct. the data consumed or the disk consumed, right? Right. So we typically, even after years of data, only take up one, maybe two percent of your disk. Yeah. In performance data, we actually have a graph. We actually graph it to show people that we're not taking up their disk. Oh, funny. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, what's the relationship, uh, last question, what's the relationship with IBM and Performance Navigator? That's a great question. So IBM has been using us since 2004. Uh, it, it, as to who, it, it varies, but currently it's through IBM TechLine. So if you, as IBMers on the phone, you could go to TechLine. Uh, the business partners on the phone, you could go to TechLine, and if you ask them for capacity planning, they are going to be using our software. And they've been doing that since 2004. Simple answer. All right. Well, we're right at the top of the hour and actually beyond a little bit. 
as always, Randy, pleasure working with you. You're just a wealth of knowledge. Um, we've had a few people say, don't ever let Randy retire. I agree, we won't. We will tie him to a fence post or something out there in Colorado. Um, for those who, has, who had the time to join us today, we really thank you. Um, a few people asked about gift cards. They will come after the event. Thank you for attending. Uh, there will be a follow-up email. This session was recorded. There will be handouts too. And of course, whatever, feel free to reach out to either Randy or I if you have any performance questions or need help along this area. You've been wonderful customers, wonderful guests today. I wanna to thank you for joining us on behalf of Help Systems. Make it a wonderful day. Yeah, thank, thanks everybody. Bye-bye.